It's great to be here. Thanks so much. Hi. <laughs> um, it's lovely to be here. I've had a wonderful reception here in Canada. Um, is Donald Trump good for climate change? Well, in policy terms, um, no, clearly not. Clearly, clearly, in policy terms, he's not advancing climate policy. He's winding it back. Um, so how far, of course, he's able to do that I mean, is, is really um, hard to say because an awful lot of what's happening now has got its own momentum. Um, we're moving very rapidly towards electrification of cars and transport. Um, we are moving very rapidly towards uh, renewables. Um, uh, uh, there is a distribution separation of, uh, of, of power within the US, which is part of the strengths of the American political system, which means that, sure, he might wind back on a federal level, but at a state level, this stuff is powering along. And the truth is uh, that the largest and wealthiest states in the US are all moving full speed ahead with renewables. Um, and even if Texas doesn't completely get climate change, I was down there and they have a extraordinary huge amounts of, uh, of wind and solar going in. So there's a lot which is happening anyway. So let us say, is Donald Trump good for policy? No, not really. But I'm not going to talk about that so much because I'm interested in the question of maybe, maybe what comes from having Donald Trump. And I'm going to say today, he's a provocateur, right? He brings things into the public realm. He brings things into the media and he provokes a response. And the case I'm going to put to you tonight is that actually, in a way, provocation and provoking response is actually maybe the most important thing around climate change. I, as I will say to you, I think we have a severe problem with the suppression of conversation, and Donald Trump brings it to the fore. Um, <coughs> I'd also say that there's some lessons we can learn from him. Not only does he actually exemplify some aspects of good communications that we can learn from, strange though that might seem, but he is a master communicator. I'm a great believer in learning from learning from all kinds of different sources. Um, but actually, there are specific aspects of the language he uses that we can learn from. So maybe I, maybe I could, maybe I, my, when I say, I drag my kids along to talks I give, and they, they usually sit reluctantly and rumblingly in a corner. And when I say, how was it? Because I'm always hoping to, I'm always hoping to inspire, my, inspire my kids, you know, like that. I always, thought, I always thought that what people did was they tried to impress their parents, and I didn't realize once you're a parent, you try to impress your children, like you want them to go, wow, that was great, Dad. And I say, so um, what do you think of my talks, kids? And they go, yeah, it's kind of good. They say, but you could really do some more jokes. I go, all right, okay. So here's a joke. <laughs> Not a, yeah, that was a joke. No, here's a joke. So, so um, a... Um, uh, so someone gets a call from their doctor, and the doctor says, well, there's good news and there's bad news. And the guy says, okay, doc, well, hit me with the good news. What's the good news, doc? And he says, well, you've got two days to live. And he goes, what? <laughs> what, that's the good news? Well, how could anything be worse than that? What's the bad news? And the doctor says, well, I, I, I tried calling you like, on Friday, and I couldn't get hold of you the whole weekend. I, I, my kids were there and they went, that's not very funny. I went, no, okay, well, I'm trying. Okay, so climate change joke. Climate change joke, of course, there's good news and there's bad news. And the good news is we have 20 years to turn this thing around. And the bad news is what the scientists have been trying to tell us since 1990. It's a kind of, yeah, you're not laughing now, right? It's, 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 for, it's the same situation. It's like, yes. There's the information, and the information isn't getting through, and we keep trying to say it over and over, and the information doesn't get through. And I guess one of the things which is fascinating about this is why this information doesn't, doesn't work, because scientists always assume it does. Um, there is, a, in communications, something called the information deficit model, which is a, a model of communications that assumes that the lack of action or the lack of engagement is because of a lack of information. And that, therefore, we need more information, and if that doesn't work, we need it in a different form, and we need to have you know, whiz-bang, rotating, animated graphics, and different kinds of graphs, and so on. Um, but there is actually very, very strong... Ooh. Um, oh, what's going on here? Oh, this thing is touchy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there is... Um, there's a very strong body of uh, evidence that actually facts and figures don't really shift views at all. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I mean, if anyone here is a climate scientist, 
Climate change is underpinned by rigorous, strong research. However, what I'm interested in is shifting views. What they tend to do is they tend to reinforce the views which were already there. Please, do come in, sir. find a seat. Um, what actually shapes people's attitudes are stories based on values. This is not some random communications marketing fantasy. This is hard cognitive, cognitive science. It's cognitive psychology. We know that we are story-driven animals, and we know that we are most strongly drawn to stories which speak to, to our particular values. Possibly the ultimate proof of the fact that facts and figures don't shift values is that there's now, don't shift attitudes, there's now a very large body of evidence supporting that. Very good, well-researched evidence, evidence both, both quantitative, qualitative, but also exper ex uh, ex experimental. And the scientific community presented that scientific research showing that presenting people straight with information doesn't pay any attention. <laughs> in other words, the scientific community is not particularly interested in the scientific evidence that their form of communicating doesn't work very well. What? Because they have a set of values which is based around holding and sharing information in a given form and that, that is very resilient to change. But danger is this last part here. But what people tend to do is they tend to form their values and their attitudes based on their worldview, on their attitudes, on their politics. We'll explore a number of these today. And then what they do is, through a process of assimilation bias, they go and they then find the information, the facts and figures to fit with the view that they form for other reasons. It's a bias. And what happens is that people who are highly intelligent and well-educated tend to do highly intelligent, well-educated bias. In other words, I have had the most extraordinary conversations with very very well-informed and educated people arguing things which are just fundamentally untrue. But they do so from a position of great verbosity, great intelligence, they know all the right words, and actually what they're saying just is simply not true. Here's a, here's a great example of it. Ah, ah, this is going to drive me mad. There we go, thank you. Um, Brexit, Brexit's, Brexit, whatever we think of Brexit in Britain, Brexit is a classic example of this at work. The, um, you'll see here, the, 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 uh, the government was running a campaign that was saying um, we need to stay in, uh, in the European Union and here are all of the reasons and the evidence for doing so and when that didn't take hold, they just tried to keep piling it on more. Here's more evidence. We're putting this evidence in a different way. Here's another role of experts. Here's the head of the IMF. Here's the head of the Treasury. Here's the head of the uh, Bank of England. Here's whoever it is and here's another stack of reports. The campaign trying to leave the European Union cruised around the country in a battle bus, the Brexit battle bus. And you'll see the phrase here, let's take back control, okay? That is a values-based narrative. That is, a, that is a, a social meme, as you can see. It's got hashtag take control. And those words, take control, immediately appeal to people who feel they don't have control in their lives. It's one of the reasons why people are actually amongst the most, uh, the most vulnerable people to the inevitable economic kind of chaos of Brexit are the ones often who voted for it because of the idea of taking control, take control of our borders, take control of our lives. But you'll notice that the battle bus is actually bringing in some statistics. We send the European Union £350 million a week, let's fund our national health service instead. So what they're doing is basically what I said, it's assimilation bias. It is, it is having a position and bringing in the facts and figures to support that position. In this case, completely wrong figures. <laughs> I mean, without mincing my words, it's a lie. It's a deliberate, it's deliberate deception. We do not send the European Union £350 million a week, and we never have done. And in any case, that ignores the money which comes, the money that we do send them, which I think is around £200, £250 million a week. Of that money, a large proportion comes back in various forms of agricultural grants and economic support. Anyway. So it's not as if we can spend 350 million on our national health. But you understand that they're compounding something, bringing in the evidence to fit. And indeed, so, so we could say it is with climate change. When I was writing my book, I had the, uh, the pleasure, the honor of going and speaking to some of the world's leading specialists in these fields of uh, cognitive psychology and, and bias. I'm not myself a, a psychologist. I, uh, my, University background was in sociology and social anthropology, and actually my real experience is based at the front line of trying to communicate with people. So uh, it was a great pleasure to me to um, 
See, and now I'm a little scared of this thing. See, if I press it, what's going to happen is it's going to go. Could you, can I just wave to you and you just click it? Okay, no, thank you. Um, um, I, uh, I had a delightful lunch with Daniel Kahneman. If anyone has read his fantastic book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, you'll appreciate it. He's a great communicator in his own right. Kahneman's also a uh, Nobel laureate for his work on cognitive bias, especially in how it affects economic decisions. There isn't a psychology Nobel Prize, but there is an economics one, which is what he, what he, won, uh, what he won the prize for. He specializes in all of the ways that, in various ways, we make irrational decisions based on internal, internal biases. And Kahneman said, that's a little wave to you, by the way, thank you. Kahneman, when I asked about climate change, said that he actually felt it was the worst possible kind of problem. It was something which uh, is not here, is not, uh, is not here, it's at some point in the future. He says we tend to, uh, we tend to disregard, push things in the future ahead. We have a hyperbolic attention for the future. In other words, the further away we get, disproportionately tips off. He said it involves cost. He says we're completely cost averse, so we're not going to deal with something which is costly. Uh, we're going to try and push it off, and again, push it away in the future. And he says there's a degree of uncertainty about what impacts will come directly to us, and he says all of his evidence shows that um, things which are uncertain tend to get pushed away. He said, this is a nightmare. This, it combines the three things we're bad at. And his own experiments, and he actually has a particular experiment which has put these three things together, which so that in economic terms people can in inevitably, uh, you know, indefinitely distance themselves from this. So there's a problem. I mean, there's a problem that the world's, the world's leading expert in this field is telling me that this is a, a cognitively difficult uh, thing for us to deal with. Um, He's not entirely right, though. He is right. He is right in a sense that something with those qualities will tend to be pushed away. But, of course, the thing is climate change isn't in the future. It's actually here and now, and it's happening right now. We've just had Hurricane Irma. Not so long ago, we had Hurricane Sandy. Um, uh, Hurricane Katrina, never mind the disasters that have happened all around the world in other countries. Um, it's also not necessarily costly. There's strong evidence that actually uh, it may, responses to climate change may be positively beneficial for our economy. Uh, and it's not uncertain because you've got every scientific institution in the world saying that this is definite. So what actually happens is an intervention which is outside his field, which is the role of narrative. People generate narratives and stories based on their values which intervene in order to create the situation that he says. In other words, it is not... It is not something which is uncertain and costly in the future. We create a narrative which places it there so that we do not have to deal with it. And that is something very, very different. So in other words, there is a willful, active role that we play in our own, uh, in our own avoidance and our own denial. Why is it doing that? I don't know. Okay, a bit funny. Um, and I guess, hmm, could we take the volume down on that? Because it suddenly seems to have gone super fast. Is it on mine? Well, maybe, look, it maybe went... This is going to be good on the video. Oh, yeah. This is going to be gripping viewing, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay, well, whilst you're doing that, I'll... I'm... Oh, how's that then? There isn't a central control on the thing. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, and I guess in a way, actually, the proof of that is... Um, can I have the next slide, please? Is um, if you ask people, who do you think will be harmed by global warming, something very peculiar <laughs> happens. You personally, your family, your community, people in the US, this is from uh, Yale Center for Climate Communications, people in other industrialized nations, developing countries, future generations of people, plant and animal species. That bottom line there, click please, um, is uh, who do you think will be harmed a great deal? And you notice something very peculiar there, which is that every single step of detachment, people's persuasion that this is going to hurt, hurt the subject increases. Therefore, there are people who think that their family is going to be somewhat more affected than them personally. <laughs> Maybe wishful thinking. Their community more so. Somehow, people think their community is going to be affected a lot less than other people in the US. Curious. Never mind other people in other countries develop and so on. In other words, what is happening is it's not so much that people think that climate change will have a worse effect on things further away, but people are more likely to believe in the impact of climate change the further away they push it. They are active participants in this narrative which creates distance for this. 
And as, as we will see with Donald Trump, the key consideration of that is cost. In other words, people are actively involved in the narrative which makes an impossible hurdle over which there's no point in us trying to, to reach. Hard, but not, but not impossible. I mean, climate change is difficult, but it's not impossible. It's an issue that people can get their heads around, they can get mobilised and engaged with if it comes in a form and shape which speaks to their values, their identity. But they become mobilised, but they become energised by, the, by the, the joy, the pleasure of being within a group of like-minded people. So, difficult though these things are, then we switch to a different narrative. It's here, it's now, it's the people around me, it's the stuff I care about. In other words, it is all, I'll keep coming back to this point, it is all in this tipping point and this variable between how we talk about it and how it speaks to who we are. This is the climate march in New York. Um, I was there. Uh, I was actually doing a book tour. It was, I didn't fly to New York just to go to a march, but I was very glad that I was there. It was fascinating. But, you know, just for a moment, let's, let's zoom in on some of those banners because this is important and relevant. The banners were massively and overwhelmingly not just left-leaning in, uh, in their perspective, but often openly antagonistic to people of right-wing or conservative values. Um, there was also, by contrast, it was interesting, Yale took photographs of every banner there as a kind of discourse analysis to see what was going on. Um, there was not a single banner there that spoke in any sense to what could be clearly identified as being conservative values. Right? It didn't say language. There was nobody there who was marching under a banner saying Texican Repu Texan Republicans demand action to defend their property. Um, there were some churches there, but they were much more of a left-leaning churches. So what was happening is that, in, in a way, it's fascinating that banners represent a kind of, um, you know, a little soundbite, a little representation of a values concern. They're basically flashing values. But 400,000 people, I was watching this, having spent a lot, of my, a lot of time sitting and talking with conservatives, thinking, wow, if I was a conservative, I would feel totally alienated by this. And this is part of a process, and this has led us, in a way, to Donald Trump. Or well, certainly it's led us to a situation where every Republican candidate in uh, the last presidential election in some way denied the importance for seriousness or outright the science of climate change. Because this polarisation comes from two sides. It comes from the conservatives moving in one direction. It also comes from the progressive and the left pushing them in that way too. Now, I don't blame my, my friends on the left or in environmental groups. All that they're doing is they've got a narrative shaped around their values. Actually, maybe if there is any blame, it's actually the responsibility lies more on the side of, of progressive conservatives for not adequately moving into that space. However, like it or not, what we end up with is a polarisation based on the, on the separation of these values. There's another problem with climate change as well, which I will come to as well. This is all laying the argument for dealing with Donald Trump, is that climate change doesn't have an enemy. Remember I said that we're driven by narratives, we're narrative animals. The dominant narrative by far, the one which energises us, is the one in which there are good guys and there's bad guys. And above all, the thing which energises us is the thought that there are an opponent, a readily identifiable opponent, Ideally, one who we're already familiar with and we know we cannot be trusted, who has the intention to cause us harm. That is why, that is why climate change, a massive threat by any rational assessment, completely fails to trigger our attention. Whereas, say, a terrorist, very often actually a mentally, mentally unbalanced, uh, marginalised character, repeatedly terrorist attacks have been by people who not even, don't even really seem to be a part of any organised conspiracy, they just seem to be like, people have just fallen off the edge, drives a car and kills some people. This is a horrible incident and it totally galvanises our attention. We're just having now, we're just having this shooting, in, uh, this shooting in Las Vegas. It totally captures our attention. We cannot look away because this is, this is somebody who causes intense harm with the intention to do so. Intention is key to our moral framework. Um, children, in experiments, children as young as three can differentiate between incidents which are caused deliberately with the intention to cause harm and incidents which are accidents. So that moral framework is there from the very, very beginning. And yet we have an issue like climate change where there is no intention to cause harm. Donald Trump doesn't intend harm. 
I mean, I mean, he doesn't. I mean, whatever we say, or whatever we, might, whatever we might say, I don't believe that for one minute. I've met many leading climate change deniers. They don't intend harm. I've met many people from the oil industry. They don't intend harm. They might be negligent. They might be seriously responsible for their misrepresentation. There's lots of things we could say. But there is not the intention to cause harm. And in the absence, and actually most of the acts that we ourselves do, which contribute to climate change, have a best possible intention. We're putting food on our table, we're doing the very best we can, we're working hard. Um, I, hey, I flew here. I flew here. As I sat on the runway, the plane was being fueled by Shell Oil, a company that I and many in the climate movement have campaigned against. How else am I going to get here? I could take the boat, it would take two weeks, and it would put more emissions into the atmosphere than taking the plane. So therefore, with the best intentions, not bad intentions, but good intentions, I have contributed. So we have this tension with the issue that we have something where there's a lot of blame, a lot of serious threat involved without a, a lightning rod. And I mean, I guess the test of that would be if, if I don't know, supposing Donald Trump's drones were, were, were floating over Asia, and they were going over spy drones, whatever, they were going over North Korea, and they found that North Korea was pumping gases into the atmosphere which were produced with the intention of destabilizing the world's climate. In other words, just imagine that climate change was caused by North Korea. And imagine that then the scientists put their heads together and they say, you know what this is really going to do? This is going to destroy grain production in the Midwest of the US, which, as we know, climate change will do. It would be a totally different moral issue, despite the fact that actually the threat and the risk is the same. Why? Because there's a single cause. And there wouldn't be any issue about, like, we don't have, that we can't afford to deal with this. Actually, the cost of dealing with it and the cost of taking on North Korea would probably be as great as the cost of major transformation of world energy system. But because it would be focused in a war against a known opponent with the intention to cause harm. I, um, when, I, when my book came out, I, um, I went to a publicist and he said, well, he said, I love that North Korea story. He says, I've got a great idea for publicizing your book. He said, I'm going to put this out to Russ Limbaugh and, and all of his climate deniers, and I'm going to put out this story about how North Korea is putting gases out into the atmosphere. We're going to see if they bite. I said, that's an amazing idea. I said, that's great. Thanks so much. He said, yeah, it's going to cost you $20,000. I went, OK, I think I'll, I'll pass on that, which I kind of regret. I think, well, maybe he was right. Maybe I could have got my, you know, become a bestseller on the back of that. So. And now here, for example, is a, is a really good epitome of this. If I can have a click. This, uh, these are the kind of adverts which ran out a little while ago now. Um, uh, in this case, against Hillary Clinton. You see, here is the overwhelming, clear threat, the evil of Al-Qaeda, um, who cuts off people's heads and then posts the videos on YouTube or whatever they do. And here is poor little Hillary trying to draw attention to climate change as a major threat. And think bubble there. Talk about a denier. Because, of course, intuitively, our sense of a threat between the two just simply doesn't match up. In the absence of clear enemies with intention, this is an open, void vacuum within which enemies attach themselves. Yeah? So one aspect of that is that there's an enemy narrative from the right for Donald Trump that things are, that this is something which is there to take things away from us, that this is a conspiracy of the left, of environmentalists, and so on. But, next please. But the same thing happens from my own side. We are always trying to shape climate change into a narrative which fits a, 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 an enemy format because we, uh, because we desperately need to do so. And I'm not saying that any of the people in here are not in some way morally culpable and responsible, but I'm afraid they don't make very good enemies, in my view. I haven't met the Cokes, but I spent a, a, a very interesting afternoon with Maren Ebel here. This is a, a wanted arrest poster put all around Paris during the Paris negotiations. Maren Ebel, um, uh, you know, for the, for the destruction of our future. Um, and I spent the afternoon with Maren Ebel, and he is not a bad man, and he doesn't cause intention to cause harm. He is deeply, deeply politically motivated to oppose me and try and undermine my work. Which is a little weird. It's like meeting someone on the dark side, you know, like somebody who's crossed through into a mirror world. Because he is a, he, I'm a communicator for action on climate change, and he's a communicator against action on climate change. And weird things happen in that space. I say, Myron, how do you feel about environmental organizations? He says, you know what, you know what George, he says, it's a real um, David and Goliath struggle. I went, really? Yeah, he says, there's us, 
with our small resources here in the Centre for Competitive Enterprise. And he says, and then there's Big Green. And he starts talking about Big Green, right? There's Big Green with a huge grant from these progressive liberal foundations trying to destroy us. I go, wow, isn't that weird? Because, you know, that's just what they say about you taking funding from Exxon. And he says, sure, we take funding from Exxon. We've, we've got a mission here, and we've got to take funding from, from, from some place, sure. And their values happen to line up with ours. I think, wow, that's very interesting. Because the causality is one where the ideology leads and the funding finds its way. Whereas my friends in the environmental movement would say, he's just a shrill for Exxon and that they fund it. In other words, the causality they try and set up is the one of intention, but I don't think it fits. In other words, climate change is this tricky space within which we try and fit it into a narrative framework, and it doesn't quite work. Talking with Myron led on to a very peculiar uh, invitation to speak with a Texan Tea Party. I'm always keen to, to take on opportunities to meet new and challenging people. This is my hostess. Um, if I can have a slide, please. Uh, Deborah. <laughs> this, is, this is not my photo. This is, this is her photo which is the photograph she used for her publicity campaign for uh, running for the Texan gubernatorial, for Texan governor, as the Tea Party candidate. You know? And she has rather a lot of guns. In fact, they all do. Um, so, um, and Deborah, not surprisingly, has her own view on climate change. Not surprisingly, it's one based around her values. Not surprisingly, it's a narrative based about intentionality. Because, lo and behold, her familiar enemies have an intention to cause harm. Yeah? It's a little disturbing talking to a group of well-lubricated and well-armed Texan Tea Party people who are telling you that actually it's people like me who are responsible for climate change in order to destroy their freedoms. But hey, we all kind of got along all right. In fact, it was clear to me it was actually a major, a major disaster, a major catastrophe that people like this, engaged grassroots political activists of whatever their political stripe, weren't involved in this issue of climate change around their own narrative and their own way of thinking. Which again brings me to the point of Donald Trump and Donald Trump supporters. It is a disaster, a disaster that Donald Trump and his supporters are not engaged actively on climate change. So rather than saying it's their fault, they're idiots or whatever, and projecting blame, let's recognise that there's a failure, something's gone severely wrong, that people of all kinds are not engaged however they can best. This, then, is the general conclusion of my book, that climate change is understood and believed as a socially constructed narrative that signals to people their identity and validates their values. That, therefore, says that um, if we can speak to their values effectively, they will get it. But the main way that we are wired to ignore climate change is that our wiring is primarily around narratives that speak to values. And that if we have a disconnection, if something doesn't speak to us or appears to come from a rival tribe or a rival set of values, that we actually very willingly disregard it. Because we, we, we have to disregard things. I guess the thing is, it's not that we're wired to ignore climate change. We're wired to ignore as much as we possibly can in order to keep sane. The example I think of this is like I was just in New York walking down the street. Walking down the street, walking down the street. You can imagine thousands of people on the streets in New York. And suddenly, weirdly, I saw someone who I'd met a couple of years earlier. And I just saw them and ping. I immediately saw them. I went, hi, hi, Dave. And we connected on the street, right? Have you any idea how amazing the human brain is to be able to do that? Out of those thousands of people, it meant I was scanning every single face as I walked down that street ignoring every single one, rejecting that information as I did so, and then I saw someone and immediately something in my brain clicked in to say, hey, you know that person, and it clicked in. So that's what we do. We ignore the vast majority of information. We pay attention to the one which speaks to us, to our social group, and to our values. And that indeed is what happens with climate change. So the trick, as we will keep seeing with this, is we need to find ways that we can speak better to those values. This is the formula that within my organisation we keep coming back to again and again and again. Effective communications start by recognising and validating who you are. This is who you are. You're great, by the way. Whatever you are. You're great. You're important. You're worthwhile. The validation comes ahead of any content on climate change. Yes, sir. The communication then reflects what they care about, not what the communicator cares about what they care about, what's important to them. This is what you care about, and it's important. And it shows evidence and proof, the social proof, that other people also care about it. With the evidence, here they are. Here are all of these other people who care. 
because the reward for taking action on climate change is not saving the planet or saving the penguin or, or, or saving future generations. It's making you who you are and making you more who you are. Whoever you are, this makes you more so. And this is what a narrative must deliver. And the world has to become the way you want it to be. In other words, the positive action, the positive solution for action isn't some randomly positive thing. It's positive in terms of the things which are important and positive to you. To you, the person who we're talking with. Next slide, please. I might briefly introduce my team at Climate Outreach. We're based in Oxford and we have social psychologists, we have scientists, we have human rights campaigners, uh, we have communication specialists. And we advise a lot of people, including the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the World Bank, British governments. Um, hopefully at some point we'll be doing, we'll be doing work also here in Canada. Um, uh, a, a bunch of businesses, all of the main environment organisations we've heard of. So one of the things we work on is this idea that everyone has a distinct way of talking about climate change emerging from their distinct values. So keep, let's keep clicking. Thanks. Great. So faith groups, for example, the reward is to be a better Muslim, to get closer to God, to be better connected with your faith, say. Senior politicians, it might be legacy. Young people, it might be something which is fun, which is cool, which is exciting to be a part of, that sense of belonging to things. Farmers, it might be better management of the land. It might be a better sense of having something to pass on, to protect. Trades unionists, it's about solidarity. It's about standing together. It's about defending your jobs. Rotary Club, it's about being a good Rotarian. Being, actually, Rotary is very involved, for example, with uh, third world development projects. Health projects is a big thing with them. We've done work with, uh, in India with Chinese, I've done a lot of work in Wales, in Scotland. In every single case, the narrative which is effective is the one which validates who they are, what you are is great, what you are is important, and when you take action on climate change, that's a very, very Indian thing to do, a Scottish thing to do, a Hindu thing to do, uh, a Rotarian thing to do, and a conservative thing to do, which is the point I'm going to come to now. And at the end of this session, we're going to talk about New Brunswick as well. Is there New Brunswick? thing about climate change which we could speak to. So, anyway, by long and, yeah, click again. Um, yeah, I, I thought a little bit of light cocktail music might be nice for this stage of evening. I, I want to book these guys, they're, they're kind of fun. I, I think they're Marines or something, and they play, play this kind of like somewhat funky light jazz. I've listened to this quite a few times now. Yeah. Get into the groove. Because we're, uh, we're going back to June the 1st, 2017 on the White House Rose Garden. And um, you see, it's kind, of, it's kind of good. I've got this on a loop. I'm thinking I might keep this playing the whole way through my talk. Um, so this is the band that's playing whilst we're waiting for Donald Trump to come and make an announcement about the Paris Agreement. Donald Trump is 30 minutes late, so we've got another half an hour of this. This, um, this um, video here was taken um, actually by one of the journalists there, and it went viral when she put it out on, uh, on Twitter. But she, she said it was rather like the little band on the Titanic, you know, <laughs> keeping up a nice little gentle rhythm. Actually, other people who went there said they had never seen a presidential announcement with this kind of thing before. So finally, here we are, 3.30, half an hour late, Donald Trump turns up, and let's see what he has to say. Oh, I was kind of enjoying that. First of all, what you are is great. I love you. You know, Donald Trump does a lot of this. I happen to love coal miners. Yeah? It's about validation. It's about wealth. It's about potential. It's about how proud we are. He's doing all of his validation stuff. Validation, this is what you care about. This is what's important to you. As we know, with the way that he talks and presents things, he just does this automatically and intuitively up front. And when, it come, when you're sitting outside, if you want to be cynical, it sounds, uh, it sounds kind of like naive or naive or ill-informed. But a lot of people see it as sincere and authentic. He won the election on the basis of this kind of language. I happen to love the coal miners. Well, part of the space he's moving into there is that environmentalists have not said that they love coal miners, incidentally. And I feel this very strongly as somebody whose own family, my grandfather and four generations back from him were coal miners, that my environmental colleagues have had a tendency to rather disregard the people working in the industry and to focus instead on the filthy stuff they dig up. Donald Trump moves into that space. 
So he's already showing us some good modeling of communications. Next slide, please. Oh, and then he starts bringing in some information. Well, it's always good to look at the small print, isn't it? So I had a look at this uh, report by National Economic Research Associates. Well, despite their name, they are actually an organization which likes to produce reports for very conservative clients actually talking about how various forms of environmental regulation don't work. But they have a little, a little, a little smidge of, um, uh, I don't know, reputation or professionalism. Because hidden in the many caveats, as it says here, could cost America as much as 2.7 million lost jobs by 2025. This, of course, is Donald Trump speaking. But when you look at the report, it says, does not take into account potential benefits from avoided emissions. Is this extraordinary? So this is a report which talks about what something might cost without, and, and again, these figures are all bent anyway, but, without, but while saying, oh, by the way, we're not going to look at any of the potential benefits of what might, what might happen as a result of this. I don't know, I was trying to think of a metaphor. I mean, is that like saying brushing your teeth every day might cost you 500 hours and, uh, and, um, and $300 in toothpaste and toothbrushes, and then it says, by the way, this information does not take account any of the potential benefits from brushing your teeth. Okay, you're not laughing, so I won't use that one again. <laughs> so, <coughs> so this, of course, again, this is confirmation or assimilation bias. This is bringing in the information to support the position that we once had. This is an entire organization, National Economic Research Associates, which specializes in this, in feeding in the bits of information to support the bias position people already have. Now, what does all of this do when Trump puts out these things, when he puts out this, uh, when he made this announcement in the Rose Garden that the US was going to pull out of the Paris Agreement? Well, first of all, they can't, because brilliantly written into the small print, more small print of the Paris Agreement, was that um, you, you actually you couldn't pull out for four years. So, that <laughs> strangely of a period of time that Donald Trump has in his first time in office. So, so in anticipation of this happening, there isn't much he can do. Secondly, in any case, he hasn't fully pulled out. He just says, we are not going to go along with this until we have, got a we have got a better deal for America. So he hasn't really pulled out. He's leaving the door open. But what also happens when he makes these announcements? Well, there's, thanks, next one, please. There's, a, an, interesting, uh, there's an interesting group at the University of Colorado who has consistently, year upon year upon year, measured world newspaper coverage of climate change. They basically scan all of the newspapers for the terms climate change. The big, big bounce was back in 2010 for uh, Copenhagen Agreement. Then it kind of goes quiet and not a lot happens. But here you'll notice these recent ones. I don't even want to try doing a point on this. Center button. Yeah, they're a center button. There. Oh, hey! That bit works. Okay, so here... So this is Paris Agreement, right? Ping, ping, ping. There, Donald Trump getting elected. There, Donald Trump pulling out of a Paris Agreement. In other words, one of the key effects here is that things go quiet and tend to go down, and the provocation here, which keeps the things bouncing back into the news, is Donald Trump. So this brings me back to a point, like, is he good for climate change? He really keeps the debate going. What is more... What is more, in a situation where there is no clear enemy with intention to cause harm, Donald Trump steps into a narrative as potentially the person who is blocking for one time that the country, the, the, the first time that the countries have all got together and agreed on concerted action. In other words, the narrative becomes focused on Donald Trump as the key opposition. This is not great. I mean, we want climate change in the center of a narrative, not Donald Trump. However, let us recognize it is keeping this issue alive. In Britain, it seemed to me that the coverage of Donald Trump pulling out of Paris was very nearly as much as the coverage of Paris in itself. In other words, this is bouncing along. In terms of building a social movement, this is very powerful because it creates a social movement with an opponent figure, which is very hard under Obama. 
for people on the left, it was hard for them to oppose a, a Democrat president. Now they're all completely geared up. But on the right, it allows the possibility that Trump is so extreme and over to one end that it allows for space for progressive Republicans to come in, as indeed they are slowly, I understand, under the radar doing so, as anti-Trump. And when they do so, everything that Trump has done that they can oppose will be in play. In other words, for the first time in a long while, there is a space for progressive conservatives in the US to say we need to take, do something on climate change because Donald Trump has created the space to oppose him and that climate change is part of the deal. The language, the last, the language around um, when Donald Trump announced this is firmly... Trump, Trump, Trump. In other words, it, Trump leads on bringing climate change. This is a word map, so every article mentioning climate change, these are the words which appear. President Trump and Trump appears way more times in the coverage on climate change than climate change does. But that's because he's leading this stuff into the column inches. Now, the reason why this is important is because I think the biggest threat that we face is, is not a Trump narrative or denial narrative, it's a non-narrative, a narrative of collective silence. Therefore, in my view, and we can argue it, in my view, anything which galvanizes, focuses attention, starts a debate, gets things flowing, allows the, you know, the 24-hour rolling media to engage in an active way for talking about climate change is valuable. Because the overall default mechanism is to push it to one side and ignore it. Because there's always going to be something which grabs our attention of some crazy guy who shoots people from a rooftop or drives his car into something or who knows what's going on, some international affairs thing or some bigger story. So stuff which keeps climate change alive is powerful. Next slide, please. Because, and next slide, please. Research which was done back in 2013, and this is the only research of its kind I know, here in Canada anyway, Ask people, how often do you talk about climate change? People are replying, I never talk about climate change with friends, with family, with strangers, produce these results. As you can see, there is a very strong tendency for people to never talk about climate change. Particularly marked is never talking about climate change with strangers. But actually, in truth, the place where people should be talking about climate change with their friends and family, there is a significant number of people who never talk about it. In other words, they never talk about climate change at all, basically, with anyone. This group of socially constructed silence, this is not just a silence of not talking about climate change, it is an active situation of not talking about climate change. It is a constructed silence within which, when we ask people in focus groups, they say, I feel very awkward talking about this. When I talk about this, the conversation dies, it goes somewhere else, people don't really want to talk about this. Has its own demographic. It is younger people who are most likely to not talk about climate change. And curiously, the group which expresses the greatest concern about climate change of younger women, 18 to 34, is also a group by a long stretch which has the least desire to talk about it. So basically, we have now for 20 years been suppressing public conversation about climate change. The conversation is way lower than it should be. It doesn't grab our attention, but also what is more, people socially suppress it. The biggest and most serious aspect of this is what happens in the conservative area. When we ask people... I should say, I should explain that the suppression of conversation is greatest amongst conservatives. But let's look at the attitudes too. On the face of it, on the top line up there, it appears to be quite promising. Apparently, 50% of people are very concerned and 30 somewhat concerned. That means 81% of people in Canada are apparently concerned about climate change. But when we break down by the politics of it, a huge disproportional split appears here. Very concerned, 16% of right wings, 80% of left wings. Not at all concerned, 18% of right wings, 1% of left wing people. Of the ones who say not at all, click please, um, it's worth saying three quarters of those are men, especially older white men. It's a category of conservatives. It's a category of people who are strongly pro prone to not thinking climate change is a problem. But the real polarisation 
is happening in these categories. Very concerned and not too much concerned. Look at this, look, look. 32%, nearly a third of right-wing people are not much concerned. Only 2% of left-wing people. So this polarization, again, is based on narratives and values. People of the right have become, come to associate not being concerned with climate change as an expression of their values and who they are. And people of the left have become connected with this idea that, uh, that they should be concerned. When you ask people in an opinion poll, are you concerned on climate change? You're not actually really getting, by and large, an answer of whether they're concerned. What you're getting, because most people, remember, don't really think or talk about it much, what you are getting is the answer, I think that somebody of my kind, doing a quick consideration of my peer group, should answer that I am concerned or not concerned in this way. And the critical block for winning over has to be this third of right-wing people who are somewhat concerned. That is the decisive group in elections. That is the decisive group for shifting forward for debate. Next slide. Next slide, please. Um, repeated surveys in the States have shown that climate change is, the, is by far and away the most divisive issue. So approval of Obama, not surprisingly, is completely split between Democrats and Republicans when this survey was done, right, in 2014. But look... Climate change is more divided than gun control. Trust in scientists, well, of course, that's also linked to this issue as well. Abortion, death penalty, evolution. It's the most divisive issue of all. In other words, you can say with more confidence on the basis of asking somebody what they think about climate change, how they're going to vote, than you can from any other question except from asking them how they're going to vote. This is, this is a deadly and dangerous situation because it means it's become completely tied in with people's politics and values and worldview. And not just in the US either. Certainly here in Canada, right across the English-speaking world, but it's very interesting study done in, but pulled together a synthesis of existing research in over 56 nations, work here done by the uh, University of Queensland, was finding that by far and away of all of the variables determining people's attitude, Political affiliation and ideology were the leaps ahead of people's attitudes. In other words, politics leads people into what they think. So a large part of my research over the last few years has been working on this issue of politics, political values, trying to find ways of speaking better and more effectively to people of conservative values. Because if Donald Trump can do it, hey, why can't we do it? Why can't we do this more effectively? Next slide. And part of that requires actually listening to people. I spend a lot of my time listening to people, listening to people in different kinds of groups, sitting around actively seeking them out. It's amazing how little of this work takes place. In my own country, no one's ever thought to go and speak, or listen, I should say, consistently to conservatives about what they think about climate change and the action they want to take on it. Next slide. We can identify these, these variables. We can, we can space them out. Uh, we can actually map them. Next slide, please. Um, and here are, that, that little C apostrophe is to say small C conservative, not necessarily conservative voters, people of conservative values. The vast majority of whom will vote conservative, but not necessarily all. We share our findings right across the field of all of the political parties. We're non-political. And, and Labour Party also, they want to know this. The Social Democrats, they want to know this. Everybody wants to know this because they're trying to speak with people. So if you could bring up all of those, please. Um, you can see here the kind of values we can notice. Respect for authority, tradition, closure, certainty, conscientiousness, uh, loyalty to a the group. Um, these are not exclusively conservative values, but they are particularly marked of people with, with conservative, conservative worldview. We could produce also by comparison a, left of, a list of left-wing values as well. But we're not concerned with that. We're concerned right now with conservatives. Let's look at number eight, fairness. Success is rewarded, transgressions are punished, right? Fairness. This idea that we live in a just world where when, when you do the right thing, you should get rewarded for that. And actually, if you do something really good, hey, it's fair enough, you get well rewarded for that. And if you break the rules, if you misbehave, if you, if you don't manage to do the right thing, that you get, that you get in some way punished. So back to Donald Trump again. Donald Trump. Donald Trump's narrative is entirely around this fair frame. Yeah? America is being demeaned. 
So it's this sense of pride. People are running us down. We want fair treatment. We want fair treatment. This is not fair. Yeah? We don't want people laughing at us. Um, so, in one sense, it sounds like a, little, like a little tantrum. On the other hand, we understand the buttons he's pressing are powerful ones. They're putting us down. They're demeaning us. It's not fair. And fairness, I might say, within his speech in the Rose Garden that day, fair, fairness is mentioned seven times. Climate change, the phrase climate change, isn't mentioned once. He doesn't talk about climate change. He doesn't talk about whether it's happening or what it is. He talks about the climate agreement, and then he says, it's not fair, seven times. So that is the focus. So what is mobilizing people on this is not climate change, it is fairness. And that is the way that values lead narratives which then pull in the information to support. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share with you some work that Louise Como, my friend here, led on. We helped to design some of the narratives on about this issue of fairness, because it's very relevant. So this is done by a number of people, Climate Action Network. It's continued with Louise here at the University of New Brunswick. Um, and this is some of the sample sizes. It's been, I think it's fair to say, the most extensive research done on how to communicate carbon pricing that I know has been done consistently in any country. But what comes through very loudly, next slide please, is that the narratives that don't work are, keep going please, are bad news, insecurity, danger, and interestingly, that there is a chance for us to make lots of money out of this, but there is an economic opportunity. Didn't score very well on the testing, but what did score well was fairness. We can learn from Trump. It's not fair that heavy energy users dump their carbon pollution in the air. Polluters should be accountable and should pay for the pollution they force all of us to live with. And then cap and trade in this case is fair. So this fair is very much front of field. Because, why is it fair? Because it rewards the companies that are most efficient and pollute the least. In other words, it is a fair contract within which the people who do the right thing become rewarded. Next slide, please. And here are the different component parts of it. So, so fair fairness. Okay. Keep going, please. Click. So if we look at those strong communications again, I don't think now I've been talking a while, so I don't think that we will do this. But we can maybe do this in the question and answer. The opportunity is to find a way that we can build this narrative around conservatives. This is who you are. You're great. What you care about. Other people like you agree. And when you do this, you belong more to your group and the world becomes more how you want it to be. This is the game that Donald Trump plays. We can do this with climate change and we can create a conservative narrative which speaks much, much better to those values. But we can also do it here in Canada. We can do this with Canadian values. We can do this with what we have in common, living in New Brunswick. Actually, click, well, just try this one, please. Living in New Brunswick. Tell me, please, if I have a microphone here. Let's just have a few words. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just run this microphone along. Give us, we'll start, actually, Louise, you can start this ball rolling. Yeah, huh? I just want a couple of words and then just pass it to the people just down here. Oh, let's just get a few things. So tell me, what are the distinctive qualities of being in New Brunswick? What makes New Brunswick special? Far away, please. Self-sufficient. Right, keep going. Pass it down. Friendly people. We refer to storms as sheep. <laughs> That's very good. Cold winters. Don't feel you have to. Okay. I don't know that that's actually the positive values of what makes New Brunswick special. <laughs> I'm especially interested in those special qualities. What are the positive? Do you have a positive aspect? Bilingualism. Okay, cool. Bilingualism. All of the things that if we were starting communications about how we can communicate climate change in New Brunswick, we would be looking for the positive qualities that this is what you are. You are great. Remember, Donald Trump doesn't go in there and complain about people. He goes in there, he complains about the enemy, but for the supporters, he's trying to weave narratives around, hey, you're great, you're the best ever, you're fantastic, I love you. He is so painfully upbeat. 
in support of people. It looks transparently fake, but not to their ears. They love him. The people who are supported by him, often the people who have been denigrated or marginalised for years, feel completely validated by him. So, New Brunswick thing. I know New Brunswick people have like a bit of a, sometimes a low opinion of themselves on New Brunswick. So I think a successful narrative here would boost New Brunswick, say New Brunswick is great. Yes, please. Those words you say are, we would say, key words. They are key parts of communications that can be woven into communication strategy. And we're going to flip through these, I think, rather than do the whole exercise. So keep going. Just go click, click, click. OK, click, keep clicking. Right. OK. These are basically the kind of questions that we could ask if we were doing this exercise in New Brunswick. Because I'm going to share with you... Next slide, please. OK. Be not easy to cope with climate change. We can do this because in New Brunswick we are... I don't know. Give me some words. Shout them out. Hard-working. Hard-working, great. Resilient. Resilient. Yeah, you've got it. Creative. Creative. Welcoming. Okay, yeah, we, we've got it. Positive aspects. The, the reason we do that is because we don't say climate change is easy. We say climate change is difficult. Easy narratives don't go well with anybody. Climate change is difficult and it's challenging, but we can deal with it because we are well skilled and endowed to cope with this. Next slide, please. So, uh, actually keep clicking. Sorry about this. Yeah. OK, keep, click, click the whole way through, right? Right, because I want to show you, I want to close, if I can, on the Alberta one. Keep going, please. So, I had a very weird week last week. Um, the blurriness of this is probably because this was 7 o'clock in the morning when, for some strange reason, people in Calgary like to have 7 o'clock meetings, I found. <laughs> and I found myself in this weird situation of a room of 130 people many of whom from the oil and gas industry, trying to construct through like an enormous, I couldn't even say a focus group, kind of unfocused group of 130 people trying to follow this pattern of can we find a way of talking about narratives on climate change which speak to an Albertan identity along the same lines. And let me share with you what came out. Start with a validation of recognising a sense of pride in the people in the oil and the gas and coal industries. So don't demean them, put them central. This is like Donald Trump saying, I love coal miners, sure, why not? Let's do that. Recognizing that the state was built on natural resources and is an energy economy. We are rich in natural resources for new forms of clean energy. It's like Donald Trump saying, wow, we've got such abundant wealth. So let's put it there. But then, here's the key bit. Having framed, having framed Alberta as an energy economy, point out that as insecurity has come from being dependent on a single source of energy, which has led to an unbalanced economy, vulnerable to outside forces. In other words, here is the opposing people who want to take stuff away from us. Yeah? World markets, energy, and environmental policies. So yeah, like it's all those guys in Paris, they want to take stuff away from us, and we haven't got control over that. Right? So the play then for rebalancing the economy is from renewables. And renewables now is a saviour, which helps us create secure long-term jobs and spread opportunities wider, spread them throughout Alberta. In other words, we have created a narrative now which is very Albertan-centric about defending Alberta and about best opportunities, building on, and building on and continuing our strengths, not making a major break with them. And these energies, will say, will also bring other benefits. So we keep climate change in play, but it comes a little bit down the line here. It comes, down as for, it comes down as the additional reasons why it's good to do these things rather than the primary reason for doing it. And meeting with people in the Alberta government, I said, I actually kind of felt on reflection that your climate leadership plan should probably have been an energy leadership plan. It would have been good to make energy the central thing, an energy economy shifting to new, cleaner forms of energy, which, by the way, in addition to all these other things, is quite good for climate change. Click, please. So, I'm just going to end, if I can, with a, a little video, and then we'll go to questions. We've been talking about how Donald Trump has a narrative which is opposed to action on climate change, and that this is a problem. I wanted to share with you a conservative narrative on climate change which supports action, and it's a very, very interesting one. Um, 
Back in 1997, Margaret Thatcher, then the Conservative leader, um, very firmly entrenched in her, in her authority as a, as, a, as a leader, she'd been in leader then, I think, for um, 11, 12 years, gave a speech at Conservative Party conference to her faithful crowd, so not even to the general public, like to the absolute hardcore conservatives about action on climate change. And notice how when she does so, she weaves a narrative which is about saying, I'm not like them, I'm like you. We are great, we are special, we are important, and we take action because of our values and what is important to us. Notice how the word she uses. Next slide, please. All of these words appear in her talk to Conservative Party conference. These words are not left-wing or environmentalist words, they are conservative words. Notice that her talk isn't something you necessarily like. You may do. Some people do. I don't. I'll be honest. I don't like her speech. That's fine too, because she's not talking to me. She's talking to the Conservative Party audience. In other words, it is possible for narratives based on values. In fact, it's required that an effective narrative based on values should speak to the values of the audience very well, which might mean not speaking to other values. Just listen to it and then we'll stop with that and we can go into questions, but listen to that and just notice that a conservative narrative, indeed under a different set of circumstances, a Donald Trump narrative on climate change might actually contain a lot of conservative values that would galvanise support and not oppose it. So here she's saying, I'm not a lefty. Yeah? I'm not an environmentalist. Yeah, I'm not a lefty. She's flagging that up. Dog whistling. I'm not a commie either. Okay, a whole set of keywords. Prosperity, technology, healthy. All piled up in a heap. So, thank you very much. I hope you found that interesting. (laughs) 
Before we go into questions and answers, you've been sitting listening to me talk for over an hour, which is a, a bit of a strain. You probably want to have a chance to talk a little bit as well. So I'm just going to give you a few minutes, if we can, just talking to the person next to you. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. But a chance maybe just to try out any thoughts you have, any challenges, things you want to say, any thoughts you have emerging at the moment from what we've heard so far, and then we'll go into questions and answers. So just a couple of minutes with the person next to you. Oh, this thing's amazing. It's all right. It's just, it's just do you want me to run that other wireless mic up to hmm? the other? Do you want me to run that handheld mic up to the stands so that people have it up there if they want to ask questions? Yeah, although, yeah, yeah, we could do. Yeah, we could do that, sure. And then I could ask them to go up to the stand, sure, we yeah, could do that. Yeah, also one of that, so yeah okay, yeah, okay, sure. That's a good idea. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit when we go into the, when we go into the conversation. Okay, everybody. I just wanted you to. I just wanted you to warm up a little bit. We can take. Well, let's just say this. Um, I I never like this format where people ask questions and then get answers. I'm actually quite happy to have people making statements as well, but not too long, please. So what we'll try and do, <laughs> so what we'll try and do is we'll just try and keep it, we'll try and keep it fairly short, and I'll try and keep my answers fairly short as well. We're not going to go on a long time. We'll, 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 we'll try 15 minutes and see how far we go with it. Um, so we've got two microphones. We've got one there, one there, and if anybody would like to, um, if anybody would like to ask a question or make a statement, or make a comment, or an observation. I won't even necessarily always feel that I need to say anything. I'm happy just to have your contributions from the floor. Who would like to shoot? Would you like to say something? Oh, yes. Great. I'm not, can I just say, I, we put it up there, but you know what, I don't love this, because it feels like you're really stepping forward, and it feels kind of, so what, what we're going to do is, I'm actually, I, I, yeah, I've changed my mind about this. I'm going to ask people to put up their hands, and I'm going to probably ask, maybe Louise, if you could take the mic to them, that would be much better. Yeah, please. Well, please have a go. Because um, a lot of you, what you're saying, makes you think of like politics and other instances, like the whole take a knee protest uh -huh. that's been happening, right? Is that how is Donald Trump reacting to it versus other things? Uh -huh. And he's reacting it to compared to conservative values. Oh, uh, the average American just wants to watch football. Yeah. Why do they ever bring politics into this, as an example? He's appealing to the average American and what he feels like the average American dog is as well as the average conservative. Um, it's just something that I've noticed. Okay. Uh, yeah. The other one's like, I see that Bernie also did a, a similar thing as well, didn't he? Mm. Um, he was trying to appeal to, but he was appealing to the left instead of the right, since you had two populists running at the same time. And I guess that's my statement. <laughs> okay, that's great. Yeah, I mean, in this, they are politicians. Politicians are always in this game of trying to find ways of matching up what they want to say in their own agenda against where they perceive the public to be. They sometimes misjudge that. But yeah, no, you're quite right. And indeed, all politicians do this. Please. So I was uh, 
Chuck Arlott est interprétateur, c'est un sort de John Queen, vraiment, il va avoir un sculpteur de poème, il va faire plus. I see myself there, which I was actually kind of surprised at. Okay. But um, the, uh, the thing about the narrative, uh, uh, it's almost like, again, I'm going to talk about the narrative, it's almost like you have to trick people on the right side, right wing side, into working on climate change by saying, well, you know, we'll get, we'll get good rewards by, uh, by, you know, by having other jobs and whatnot. And, and by the way, oh, good, good uh, climate change, we can fought because of that. So in other words, mm -hmm. it's, it feels like the left side is saying, well, we need to do, we need to take sacrifices to fight climate change to protect our children's future. Whereas the right side is saying, well, we need to have uh, validation now. We don't really care what's happening in the future. And, 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 uh, like I say, it feels like I'm locked into something there. But just, I just had that sense coming. But I don't, I yeah. No, I, I, think, I think the rules for left and right are exactly the same, as indeed for anyone, as indeed probably in truth for any form of communication. It starts with recognition and validation of who you are. The, the, the current narrative on climate change is strongly geared towards left-wing validation. Yeah? It's saying we need to take on and we need to fight the, uh, the, the forces of capitalism, the forces which have brought this upon us. The narrative is that... The narrative is that it's particularly large corporations and oil and gas companies have brought this upon us. Um, and we are going to have to, we're going to have to cut back and we're going to have to, we're going to have to, we're going to have to change the economic system. In other words, the dominant left-wing narrative on climate change is you cannot have, you cannot stop climate change without system change. I've heard that a lot, right? In other words, by taking action on climate change, you get the world you want to see. And the world he wants to see is one where there is system change. We are going to fight for climate justice as a means to achieving social justice. In other words, not only do we care about social justice and we're going to take action on climate change because we care about it, but also we are going to achieve means of social justice through, you know, through the medium of action on climate change. Um, that narrative is already there. It's one in many ways, but politically, personally, I don't mind saying where I sit, I, I, sh I share a great deal of that. However, that is a values-constructed narrative. The rewards which are given there are rewards in terms of validation of values and moving the world towards where you want to see it. It doesn't necessarily remove, um, it doesn't necessarily remove sacrifice or, or cost, but it recognizes that this is a difficult situation. But it's difficult because the world is difficult because we've always known it's difficult in these ways. It is not true that a conservative narrative has to somehow reward people financially or give people goodies. Conservatives are, well, the research suggests that they are actually, if anything, more prepared to do personal sacrifices than people on the left. The question is, what for? And for many people, for conservatives, it's about the defence of a group and the defence of their own values. In other words, to keep the things which are key to us, the institutions and the way, things which are vital to us, the family and community in particular, we might have to all pull together and we have to be prepared to make sacrifices. So once it's framed in those terms, it works well. The rewards don't have to be, hey, there's great opportunities and you make loads of money out of this. It can also be, it can also be but yeah, this is going to be hard and difficult, but we all have to pull together because that's who we are. And the rewards, therefore, are the rewards that we get the world we want to see. It's one where people have a stronger sense of purpose, a stronger identity, people come together, people work hard in order to defend the group, which is a key, key conservative principle. Do you see what I mean? I don't think, so I think actually that the way that this is shaped for any group is similar, but the outcome of how it's expressed is fundamentally different for each group. And I also, I'm not surprised you find values of your own in there. Um, there's an enormous amount of overlap between values. They become expressed in different ways in different language. So, you know, what, what left-wing people might call justice, people on the right might call fairness. They're talking about a very similar set of concerns and values. Please. Hi. Thank you. Hi. One really interesting point I thought was the slide about the people's uh, climate march and just the signs and how they were geared towards the way people are watching, yeah. what, like how you communicate, how you can push people away. My question is that it's so hard and takes so much time to really build up a strong belief and, and, and kind of believe in climate change where a small, a much smaller amount of time can be used to create doubt, to 
create a mm. spirit of doubt that can be driven in, that can create, you know, all oh, what if and maybe not. What, in just all your work with communications, what have you found to be the most effective uh, tool or method against doubt, in a way, against that kind of ease that doubt can be employed to create dissension? So, we can unpack doubt a little bit. We all have varying degrees of doubt. I have degrees of doubt. I can't say to you that I am uh, you know, 100% accepting of climate change and what it means. That doubt isn't because I question the science, but doubt is because I can't allow myself to get too close to the truth. We need to recognize that doubt or various forms of denial are a form of defense mechanism. And I think some very interesting and well-informed work has been done by the people who come in from a kind of psychotherapy position on this. Um, normally, I would be very hard-nosed and evidence-based and say, no, this has to be very strongly about psychology, cognitive psychology, and so on. But the insights coming in from the people working in this field are so appropriate and useful but I think we need to recognize that what tends to happen is, as I said, that they, that they are indeed correct. But the doubt or the denial comes from actually wanting to protect yourself from the full implications of, of what this means. But of course, also that is then played into by people who have very strong interests for generating and expanding that doubt. And um, excellent book by Naomi Oreski is called Merchants of Doubt, specifically looking at this issue of, of how it is that people how it is that vested interests and particular information, uh, communications companies brought in by the vested interests protecting fossil fuels have generated an, a situation of doubt quite deliberately, quite strategically, again, following the past experience with the tobacco industry, how the goal there is not to say that climate change is not happening, but to say we're not quite sure yet as to whether it's happening. And that is a, that is a strategy. Now, the reason it's successful is because it also plays into a very strong desire to doubt, probably if anything stronger than with smoking, you know, a very strong desire to go, okay, this is, this is so challenging to my worldview in the way that I see the world, I'm quite prepared to go along with this doubt. How we challenge it is, I think, to recognize that there is scientific proof and social proof, and social proof is way, way more powerful. The thing that overcomes doubt and creates certainty is the presence and existence of people within your group who express that certainty. People, I mean, let's put it bluntly, people will believe anything if the people around them in their social group believe it. It is very, very hard for us to hold on to something, even something we know to be true, in the face of a concerted opposition of the people around us. So when we have something which is, which is true, is, is based in, in truth, that actually it is very, very hard for us not to accept that when it is promoted actively by people around us. And I keep coming back to this thing. It's about the conversation, it's about the presence of a social proof of, of what is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and the key solution to this has to be two things. First of all, enabling a much broader conversation in which people really actively engage with this publicly. But I think also, um, it has to be enabling the people who already have a point of view to make that point of view clear. So, so part of what happens repeatedly in surveys is you get very different answers from if you ask people what's your attitude on climate change, or if you ask people what do you think the attitude is of other people on climate change. People hugely underestimate the level of concern in wider society. So they are concerned despite the fact that their kind of social scanning is telling them that other people aren't concerned, which actually goes to show how concerned people are. In other words, they are several, they take the benchmark of being a lack of general concern and then they set themselves a little bit higher above it. The starting point has to be for people to be aware of how many people like themselves are concerned. Because they're actively, they, that, that, is the social, that is the social signal that tells people that this is not something to doubt or to avoid. How we do that is very hard, but I think the starting point has to be people coming out, <laughs> if, if I can say that. Like, people coming out as, as, as climate people, saying, saying, this is who I am, this is important to me. And especially people who are in the, the areas where this is challenging. Remember I mentioned the Texan, the, the Texan Tea Party? 25% of people in the Tea Party think climate change is a major threat caused by humans. 25%. It's way lower than the general population, but crikey, it's a lot of people in a, in a tea party, right? 
and they're not feeling the space or opportunity to share that openly. So the starting point has to be to have people say, this is what I think, this is important to me. And it's a debate also that includes people who are sceptical of the issue as well. Fair enough, let's have that out in the open and let's have a conversation, not shouting across each other, but a conversation that says, sure, we can have a range of views on that, but let's keep everything in proportion. Does that make sense and answer your question? There's a gentleman here standing over by the microphone, did you? Um, no? Okay, sure, please, hi. Hi. Well, let, let me throw it back to you. I'm interested. I'm, I'm sorry to keep you in the conversation, but you'd, I'd be interested to know what, what, where does that feeling come from, that sense of being an enemy? Describe to me, what, does that, what, what is that enemy? En enemy for whom? I mean, all you're doing is just talking about something which is of concern to you and concern yeah, well, surely for all of us. Where does that yeah, come from? Yeah, and I'm recognising this is very hard. I want to say also that, however, that challenging collective silence has been an absolute key strategy for many, many of the social changes that we've seen, including the, the, the extraordinary changes which have happened over my lifetime, for example, in some of the attitudes towards race, the continuing struggle that we have here with reconciliation with indigenous peoples here in, here in Canada, the starting point for that has been confronting some of the silence, the appalling silence about what has happened. And this is painful, but it's the starting point. It allows the opening up of the space. The starting point, or I think one of the key, one of the key things which shifted attitudes towards gay and lesbian people was the point where a social space was enabled for them to come out, and that's why I said come out earlier, to come out and say, hey, mum, dad, this is who I am. And this is a painful process, but as soon as you realise that this is not invisible, but this is a group of people who are everywhere amongst your closest family members and your closest friends, things change. So I'm not saying this is easy, I'm saying it is difficult and challenging. But of course it also has momentum. Because as soon as people start doing that, other people start coming out. The question is how to do this in a way where you don't feel, feel personally attacked and exposed and also where you don't feel completely isolated. So something I'm always urging campaigners to do is let's have a campaign about breaking the climate silence that allows people like you, for example, raising this issue, not to feel isolated, but to feel that you're part of a movement. My interest in this is in saying actually that starting that conversation or opening it up is actually probably the single most important climate change act that you can do. I mean, unless you are directly involved with, you know, with flying around the world constantly or, or setting fire to things, <laughs> unless you're a professional arsonist, you, your impacts in other areas will always be, will, will always, you know, we talk about vegetarianism. The conversation is actually, in a way, a more important issue than, than, than the personal lifestyle. How you do that without confronting people, well, I mean, I have the ease, in every conversation I have, I just say what I do for my work. So if you have a feel, if you're working in this field, it's great, just drop it in. The majority of times that conversation goes nowhere. Right? Occasionally you get somebody who really disagrees with you, which is kind of fun, at least they want a conversation. Occasionally you get somebody who really wants to talk about climate change, and that is a revelation. But what you have done, it's a bit, you know, is you're just saying, hey, climate change, it's out there, it's, 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 it's in this social space here. Weird weather, wow, weird weather we're having at the moment. I think, I think it's because of climate change. The conversation will probably stop dead there. You have put that out into the social realm. Yeah? And you have had weird weather. We've all had weird weather. It happens the whole time. It's not, like, it's not like we're now lacking hooks on which to start a conversation. right? The important thing is the I in this. 
So people feel accused when they hear that we need to do this or you need to do this. I think that the answer is very much about holding the view yourself. Um, saying, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a vegetarian, you know. I'm a vegetarian, this is important to me, this is why it makes me feel good. You can do whatever you like, this is how I feel about it. Uh, you know, I'm very concerned about climate change, that's why I'm doing this. I, uh, in, every time I'm on a plane, by the way, I always, at some point in the conversation, drop in the fact that I'm very uncomfortable taking this flight because I care deeply about climate change, but I, on balance I've decided it's okay to do it because I'm going to go and talk about climate change. Most conversations, that dies, by the way. <laughs> Fine, I'm not surprised, because people will hear it, maybe, as a judgment. But there's nothing very judgmental in that. I'm just saying me, right? But on the way here, up from New York, I was sitting next to a guy who's in the US Air Force, and a strong Trump supporter, incidentally. And he really picked up on it. And he said, well, tell me about that. Like, why, why is it that you feel that way? He said, I'm not so sure about climate change. But he wanted to talk about it. And I just think, OK, this stuff is powerful, right? So I'm sorry, I haven't given you great ideas. But I'm just thinking, that holding. I've taken a lot of inspiration, by the way, from evangelicals. I spend a lot of time with evangelicals. So I'm kind of very interested in what they say. And this idea of what holding and witnessing your faith is, is a key expression of your faith. It's so fundamental to them. I think it applies to people who, who accept climate change, too. But actually holding that belief and sharing it publicly, publicly is part of the deal. And it's a bit challenging, but it's part of the deal, and it's a useful thing to do. Yeah, please. More, more on this one, but if somebody were to prove to you tomorrow or even later yeah. Yeah, that the road you're on, yeah. it can be scientifically proven they're wrong, yeah. perhaps would you abandon your life's work? Willingly. Your, your higher education? Willingly. 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 I don't want to do this work. I mean, I enjoy my, I love my work, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, I dare say from what you're saying, Sammy, you see this as a challenge to present me with some information. Um, I mean, I'm interested. Do you know the yeah. difference between resonating radiant energy? No, I don't need to. I mean, with all respect. Radiation or yeah. dust in the air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, but Ronald Reagan was warned in 1983 yeah. okay. Okay. that if you declassify digital frequency technology okay. to grow the radium telecommunications so. industry a thousand times bigger overnight, okay. and he did, it would change the weather on the planet, okay. and it has. Okay. We turned off. Atmospheric microwaves, 80% of them that were running the uh, cell phone industry between the year 2002 and 2013 because they were killing children. It's all been replaced with radio technology. Only 20% of it today runs off the microwaves. And it was all because on 9-11, they turned off the cell phone system for okay. six hours. And we turned off the carbon-14 dioxide, which is only made by radiation. Mm -hmm. That was accounting for 70% of the growing greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. We turned it off for six hours, and it proved that the cell phone industry was behind or this event that Ronald Reagan did uh -huh. in 1983. So it was causing yeah. global warming. And now one group you didn't have on your list up there was the military. Okay. The military is all behind all this propaganda to protect their military interests because 60% of what Ronald did, Reagan did was for their military interests. Okay, can I, can I reply to this? So, so what I would say to that is, with respect for what you're saying, I, I don't agree with it, but well, I think I, it, I, no, think, but, I okay. By your queen. Okay, okay, but no, 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 because now, now I'm going to interview. this information with okay. you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to say is. I, I have a bus to catch. Okay, all right, <laughs> all right, okay. I'll send you an email. All right. I have your email address. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Probably the most important bird you met on your travels in North America today. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. What? Questions? Please. Can uh, we just ask you to, mm. to say a bit more about how you would have the PSD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> sure. Sure. My position. It's all right. Why don't why don't you ask your question then? So why don't you ask your question when here? Well, no, nobody's rushing me. They're delaying me. <laughs> no, actually, no one's delaying you. We're asking no, your no. question. Uh, you had uh, you asked people for descriptions of uh, 
of this province. Mm -hmm. And you put up a slide that showed uh, uh, information about um, Alberta. Mm -hmm. This province is a have not province. Okay. We take transfer payments from the federal government. Alberta is a have province. Mm -hmm. And so the money that and so their transfer payments go to the federal government and we receive them. You pointed out that they uh, their big industries are oil and gas and coal, which contribute to the speed of climate change. We might want to delay climate change, but we want our transfer payments. So, what are we going to do? Deny, refuse transfer payments because we want to slow down uh, climate change? I don't think so. That wouldn't be practical. We accept those industries which speed up climate change in order to receive transfer payments. Thank you. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering as I hear that, remember I'm an outsider, I'm new to Canada, but I'm wondering if in this idea of, of, of New Brunswick being a have-not province, whether there is whether there is grounds for building a more constructive narrative rather than, rather than I hear a lot here in New Brunswick about how New Brunswick is, a, is somehow lower status or deprived or the last in line, I hear all of this. I'm wondering if there isn't the grounds here for talking about the opportunities, maybe not of climate change, but maybe of new forms of energy for New Brunswick to be a half province and actually to be ahead and to be confident and to be strong. Let me have the... But thank you for your points. Let me have, there was one, was there one more then? He wants to know what your response would have been to the previous guy. <laughs> oh, the response to the previous guy? Um, tricky. <laughs> because unfortunately what he was talking about is, is, is um, I, I'm familiar that there's a whole lot of stuff going around with, there's a whole set of interlapping conspiracy theories concerning uh, microwaves concerning the, uh, the HARP um, station in, I don't know, Antarctica, which is some US station which is pumping out microwaves, this idea that people are interfering with the world's climate. Before I talk, answer that, I'd say there's a very interesting phenomenon, which actually just exemplifies what I'm saying, that um, people, that a leading cause of climate change are vapor trails coming out of the back of jet planes. Right? Not a huge cause, but a, but a major cause. We know jet planes are a huge cause of, of climate change, right? But what exacerbates the impact of the fuel that they burn is the fact that they produce these high-level vapor trails which spread out through the sky, they create cirrus clouds which then trap heat. And you can see that when you look up and you look up at a sky which has got fairly still air and it's got a lot of planes, but it spreads out right across the surface. It creates a kind of a network, a web of these vapor trails. There is a whole... Cons now, actually, people pay very little attention to that. Environmentalists in particular very rarely talk about flying because they fly a lot. <laughs> I mean, it's true. It's true. And whenever people list the things you can do on, on climate change, they're very reluctant. And they say, oh, we don't really want to talk about flying. But they don't really want to talk about it because actually in many ways the people who are doing the communicating are complicit themselves in it. Hey, I have to include myself in that. Um, so they don't talk about it. The people who do talk about it are the people who are convinced that there is an international conspiracy to put chemicals into those vapour trails. And that what you're seeing there are freaky, are freaky spreads of vapour trails going through the sky which are changing the world's climate. In other words, because they believe for unknown reasons that people have created, are changing the weather through the vapour trails, and that there is an enemy intention to change the weather through the chemicals and the vapour trails, they can believe in it. Once an enemy is inserted into a narrative, it becomes compelling and spreads widely. When there isn't an enemy in the narrative, hey, it's just people flying around, probably just going off for a holiday, it is not compelling. So in other words, it's this thing I'm pointing out before with climate change, but it's this presence or absence of an enemy which is such an issue for us. And actually what I was hearing there was I was hearing a microwave-related enemy narrative. In other words... In other words, this idea, that, this idea that there is something which is going on which is changing the weather which is related to an intention to cause harm. In other words, exemplifying what I'm saying. Like, if we have an intention to cause harm, it becomes a compelling narrative. To be honest, when I, I find this stuff fascinating, 
And actually, if he'd stayed around, I would have taken the time to sit down and listen to him. So I'm very interested in hearing how his arguments are constructed, so I'm sorry he left. Um, but my, my way of dealing with this would be to say, thank you very much. I don't agree with you, but thank you for sharing that. Uh, and I will always respect that there is a useful debate to be had. Um, and that you've had your point of view and I've had mine, and I try and have a situation where I don't get into a head-to-head. Into -head. That was a little bit off the wall, that comment there. But if you've got some, something which is a more moderate or balanced position, then I'd be more inclined to try and find some common ground. But I will say, strategically, I don't spend a lot of my time arguing with people who don't believe in climate change. It's, it's, it's too hard for me to find that space. But also, I'm not going to denigrate them and say that they are fundamentally wrong. I'm going to say... You're entitled to your views, I'm entitled to mine, I completely believe in what I'm saying, and so does the vast majority of world scientists, and that's good enough for me. That's what you were saying with the somewhat people. Huh? The conservatives and the somewhat believe in climate change. Somewhat. Uh, in, uh, in your graph. The people who believe it, the, the somewhat people who believe that you want to make them very believe. Yes. Yeah. That's right, that's right. So it's an evaluation of what chance I can get of any individual. Thank you. I'm going to wrap up. Okay, that's good. Okay, that's good. Yeah.